Okay, so what we're talking about today are monocots, um, and we're just getting the introduction to monocot plant parts. Uh, monocot plant parts have some similarities and some common um, uh, parts uh, as the dicots have, um, but they grow quite differently, um, and uh, and um, so they're typically treated differently from a maintenance standpoint. Um, and it's important for us to understand uh, how to recognize a monocot plant, but then also the parts of the plant that we use for identification purposes, okay? So to look at a couple of monocot um, plants, uh, these are uh, some different monocots from, eh, I guess, around the world. Um, we've got a formium here. This is um, also known as uh, flax. Uh, we've got a juncus here. Juncuses are rushes, okay, monocots, and they're rushes. Um, they're considered rushes. We'll go into sort of the difference in the rushes and sedges and um, uh, grasses, etc. Um, later in the semester. Um, here we have Mullenbergia rigens or deer grass, California native. Here we have Botoloa gracilis, another California native. Here we have a mat rush. This is called Lomandra. This is Australian native here. Um, and then we also have a carex here. So this is a sedge. Now, <clears throat> generally um, uh, of the grass-like plants, the grass-like plants. Um, these are sort of the um, grass-like plants that we typically consider as grass-like plants. Um, so some of them are true grasses. Um, uh, some of them are rushes. Some of them are sedges. And each one has like a little bit different characteristic. And then also um, there's different seasons that many of these grow um, uh, more profusely in, or maybe uh, they might go dormant at certain times. So with dicot plants, typically we look at dicots and we consider whether they're evergreen or deciduous, right? Now, the majority of the deciduous plants and the great majority of the deciduous dicot plants are deciduous during the cool, the cool season. So during um, cool weather, during winter, um, they will lose, they will have lost their leaves in fall, they're dormant, um, and they don't uh, push leaves out until uh, spring. <clears throat> uh, there are also some dicot plants, broadleaf plants, that are uh, summer dormant, okay, or drought dormant. Um, and there's some really cool examples of those um, where essentially uh, as soon as weather gets too hot and there's not enough moisture in the ground, um, uh, those plants drop their leaves and go dormant. Um, so again, those are uh, uh, sorry, those are uh, deciduous dicot plants. Now with monocots, they, it's, it's relatively similar with a couple other dimensions to it. So <clears throat> with monocots, there are some monocots that are evergreen, okay, evergreen. They don't have like a true heavy dormancy period. So formium is an example of a monocot plant that doesn't have a true dormancy period. So for lack of a better term, um, an evergreen monocot. Um, care, uh, sorry, juncuses generally uh, same. They don't have a true dormancy period. Um, uh, the mat rush, the lomandra, and um, the carex, the sedges, typically those don't have a true dormancy period either. Whereas um, uh, the uh, Bodaloa shown here has a dormancy period. It is in the winter time. And so in the fall, it will start 
um, sort of its leaves will start to die out. It'll start storing its energy in its root system and in its crown. Um, and it will essentially just go to sleep for the winter time and then spring back up in the spring. Mullenbergia rigens, um, same thing. Uh, it does have a true dormancy period, although it has a little bit different of a dormancy period, okay, um, uh, than uh, sort of normal winter dormancy. Now, there's also some monocots that while they are, I guess, you know, quote unquote, grass-like in appearance, they do have some really showy flowers to them. So here we have Agapanthus, Agapanthus, okay, or Lily of the Nile. Here we have Iris Douglasiana. This is the Douglas Iris. This is a California native. Here we have Anagazanthos or Kangaroo's Paw, okay, Australian native here. Very cool plant, very, very showy flowers. Um, and here we have Cicerinchium bellum. Okay, this is blue-eyed grass, and this is a California native. Okay, now Anagazanthus doesn't, I'm sorry, not Anagazanthus, um, uh, Agapanthus don't necessarily have a true dormancy period. Typically, um, they're green throughout the year. They do have a specific flowering season, um, but again, they don't have a true dormancy period. Um, the Iris Douglasiana does have a dormancy period. The Anagazanthos does not have a dormancy period. And the Cicerinchium bellum actually has a really cool dormancy period. Last slide, I was talking about how there's some dicot plants that are summer or drought dormant. Okay, so as soon as it's too hot and there's not enough water in the soil, it will go dormant, right? Now, Cicerinchium bellum does the same thing. Uh, typically, uh, midwinter, late winter, it will start to emerge and start um, in very, very early spring, start pushing out really cool flowers. But then as soon as hot, um, hot temps hit in California and there's very little moisture in the ground, they will essentially die back, okay? So there's ways that you can utilize these types of plants in the garden. Um, a lot of times in our perennial beds, so perennials are plants that um, uh, die back during a dormancy period, but then come back every year, okay? Annuals, um, uh, grow once, they have one single season. Once they're done, they're dead, they die back and they they can reseed, but that specific plant will never um, continue to live. Okay, So um, in perennial gardens that typically the majority of the perennial gardens that we um, have in, in, in our region, in California, typically, and really frankly, you know, throughout the United States, the world, um, many of our perennial gardens are showiest or most full and lush during um, beginning in spring through the summer, toning down in fall, and then primarily going dormant in the wintertime. So it's actually a really cool move to be able to throw some Cicerinchium bellum or plants like it into those areas so that during those dormancy periods, you get some really cool shows um, and different types of flowers coming in. And then by the time the Cicerinchium bellum starts to die back, when it starts to go drought dormant, that's, that's when the rest of the perennials are really starting to emerge and do their thing, okay? So really cool ways you can use monocots, but again, there's a lot of dimensions to monocots, just like with dicots, um, that we need to think about and consider from a overall plant care standpoint, from an identification standpoint, and a plant selection standpoint, okay? So let's dive into monocot plant parts, okay? And this is just a simple diagram of a monocot. You can see it's a grass or grass-like plant, and that's primarily what we're gonna look at because it's a little simpler than diving into all of the rest of the um, monocot plants because, again, there's a lot of them, and then most of the flowering ones have some little different um, uh, identifying characteristics, but 
still many similar identifying characteristics. So again, we're looking at a, um, a, a diagram of a monocot plant, and this is a grass-like plant, okay? So in this example, you can see that we have roots, and there's a couple different um, different types of roots here or modified stems. You can see that there's a rhizome called out here and a stolon called out here. It's good to note that many, um, many monocot plants um, have rhizomes and stolons. Uh, and you can see that these rhizomes and stolons, these adventitious roots or modified stems, um, really help to uh, help the plant to spread and establish. Not all monocots have these, and there are some dicots that have rhizomes and stolons. We're not going to go into detail on the rhizomes and stolons because we will have a lecture that's specifically dedicated to roots, okay? But good to note it, talk about it briefly because we are looking at this diagram. So as we travel up this plant, we have this specific area here. It's not labeled. This is the crown right here, the crown. Okay. So, um, uh, and, and I'll talk about that in a subsequent slide, like what sort of the significance of the crown. Now, on this particular diagram, we see that there's a stem-like structure that comes up, and then there's some leaves that come off of that. Okay. Now, not all monocots grow like this. If we look at a Carex or a Mullenbergia, they don't necessarily have a, a, a um, uh, somewhat of a stem. All of the foliage emerges from the crown, okay? So not all monocots will have this feature where they have a node, okay? And remember, we have nodes on... Um, uh, dicot plants. Uh, and again, not all monocots will have internodes, but some of them do. Um, so if you think of bamboo, okay, bamboo definitely has this type of structure, right? Um, and then some other grass-like plants have it as well. Some do not. So um, if we're looking at this, we have the crown, we have a node, an internode, another node and not labeled, we have another internode, okay? And then we go to flower stalk. So if we jump back to the Mullenbergia, that flower stalk and the from the Bodaloa as well, and shoot, I guess, frankly, all of these, okay? All of these, this flower emerges directly off of the crown. Okay, and does not have this stem-like feature, although some monocots do have them. So now let's look at the leaf parts, okay, the leaf parts of a monocot. So the leaves of a monocot are sort of interesting and, again, somewhat similar to dicot leaves. The only thing that's very dissimilar to the majority of dicots, although there are some dicots that have this feature. They do not have petioles. They do not have petioles, okay? So if we look at this leaf blade here, this leaf blade here, this is just a portion of the leaf. Also included in the leaf is a transition to what's called a sheath. A transition to what's called a sheath. Now, this leaf right here, this entire leaf, this portion is the leaf blade. This portion is the leaf sheath. It has no petiole, and this entire leaf comes off of this node right here. Okay, so from this node emerges the leaf with no petiole. It has a sheath and then a blade. The transition from the sheath to the blade 
has some really interesting characteristics to it. Okay. And these are the primary identifying characteristics of grass like monocot plants. Okay. And so that's primarily what we're going to look at in this presentation. So on this leaf, again, we have the sheath. And if we look at the inside of that transition from the sheath to the blade, we've got some identifying characteristics to look at. Of course, there's the blade itself, and there's going to be some identifying characteristics of the blade. There's going to be what's called a ligule, okay, and we'll go more into detail on that in a minute. There's also an oracle, an oracle. Okay, so oracle. And an oracle is a short, often claw-like appendage at the base of the leaf blade that tends to clasp the sheath at the culm internode, okay? And again, the oracle will look at some specific examples, but that's essentially what it's doing. Now, um, uh, the ligule is essentially an extension of the sheath, okay? So the sheath comes up and it's some slight extension of that sheath. So that's the interior of the leaf sheath to blade transition. On the exterior, the outside side of the plant, we have, of course, that transition from blade to sheath. And on that, we have what's called a collar. Okay. So typically, from an identifying identification standpoint, we are looking at the overall plant itself. And we're also looking at growth characteristics and leaf characteristics. Okay. And the parts of the leaf that really help us with those identification or with that, those identifying characteristics are the blade, the ligule, the oracle, and the sheath, okay? Now, a minute ago, I talked about the crown, okay? The crown here. So this crown region this crown region is um, is an, an interesting region of the monocots. With dicots, remember the apical meristem or the majority, the, the main area of meristematic tissue is at the tip of the plant, right? It's at, at the top of the buds. Um, uh, and remember that apical meristem, um, has dominance, and if you pull that off, then you get a bushier, um, you get bushier vegetative growth, and you get a bunch bunch of auxiliary buds that um, uh, that compete for dominance. Okay. Now, so um, that essentially tells us that the meristematic tissue is the primary meristematic tissue and the primary growth region of that dicot plant is at the top of the plant, okay? And I've also mentioned that there's some other areas within dicot plants that have meristematic tissue, okay? Now, with monocot plants, with, gra with grass-like plants, 
The apical meristem is, a, is at a very, very different location, typically, right? There's always exceptions, but typically it's in a very different location. So this is a cross section of this crown region down here, okay? That transition from the above grade portion of the plant to the below grade portion of the plant. And what you can see here is there's an apical meristem in there. Okay, there's an apical meristem. So that apical meristem is not at the very tippy top of the plant. It's down at the ground. And so any growth emerges from the base of the plant or from the ground. Okay, So you can see here, we've got a leaf blade. We've got leaf sheaths. Okay. And we've got that apical meristem. And then with some of them, there's auxiliary buds um, uh, tucked in below that apical meristem. So it's essentially like the dicot um, structure, but um, uh, tuck, essentially shrunk way down and is very, very compact. Okay, so what that tells us from a maintenance standpoint, how do we treat these plants? What that tells us is we can cut these essentially all the way to the ground at the right time of year. We'll talk about that later in the semester for different types of plants, different types of monocots. We can cut them all the way to the ground as long as we don't damage the apical meristem, okay? as long as we don't damage the meristematic tissue here. Now, some monocots, so we'll jump back to this one where they actually have a stem-like structure to them. Okay? And there's, there's a lot of them, but generally, um, you know, there, there's more that do not have a stem-like structure to them. This is called a culm, okay? This is called a culm. And this would be, this would be a culm node, okay? So instead of it being a stem or a trunk, it's considered a culm, okay? C-U-L-M. So, on this culm, if it exists, then there is a node. And at the nodes, that's where we typically find a little bit of metastomatic tissue as well. So if you, uh, there's some plants that you can reduce the height of and cut them at a node and it will die back to the node and should survive. And it may, there may or may not be um, enough meristematic tissue in there or buds to, to be able to develop a bud. Pretty rare. Although, let's jump to this one. This is an example, and I mentioned this one. Bamboo is a monocot plant, and they do have these culms and nodes and internodes. And the meristematic tissue at the um, at the nodes are called intercalary meristems, intercalary meristems, okay? So the length of the internode increases due to the activity of the above tissue. So as this plant grows, as this culm grows, um, it develops nodes. And as these nodes develop, there's a zone of elongation above them, okay? So at this node, typically you're gonna find some leaves popping out. Sometimes you may find some buds there, um, typically dormant buds or buds that are waiting for the top of the plant to die back, and then it will become dominant and be able to push out some additional leaves and buds through there. But intercalary meristem, okay? Again, this is a little bit, I, I guess, less, common in monocot plants, but important to know. Okay, it's important to know where the where the meristematic tissue lies within certain plants because, or to be able to recognize where meristematic tissue is because it helps you to be able to identify 
where you where to make the most appropriate cuts or pruning wounds on these plants. Okay, so intercalary meristems. Again, the apical meristem is typically located at the base of the plant. And then there's some other areas where there are some meristematic tissues. And um, this is an example, intercalary meristems. And those are found at the nodes. And just above that, there's a zone of elongation. So let's talk about the identifying characteristics of monocots and specifically grass-like plants, because these are kind of the most complicated ones, the most challenging ones to identify. But really, really critical to be able to identify um, monocot plants, ideally with in the absence of a flower, okay, in the absence of a flower, um, uh, because a lot of monocots are maintained in a way that we will never, ever, ever see their flowers, okay? Example of that are our turf grasses. Our turf grasses, um, are um, monocots, um, but they're maintained in a fashion that essentially continuously cuts their leaf blades down, okay? And we keep them very low to the ground. And so if you have a lawn area or a sports turf area, park, golf course, et cetera, you never want to let those um, those plants go to flower. Okay, once they go to flower, typically they die off. Um, not all, but the majority of them do. And so, being able to identify the grass by the leaf parts only is very important. Not only to be able to identify turf grasses, but there's many, many weeds that. Um, that are really challenging weeds to deal with in, you know, I say the Sacramento region, but really anywhere. Um, uh, uh, so examples of those would be Bermuda grass, crab grass, Dallas grass, um, Johnson grass. Uh, there's a lot of monocot weeds out there that um, are some very, very challenging to deal with. And Bermuda grass is one of those grasses that is a very persistent grass. Um, again, we're not going to go into it, but I can't help myself. Um, it spreads by rhizomes and stolons, and it spreads aggressively. The reason we don't like it is because if we jump on back to these grass-like plants, um, and talking about dormancies, the primary reason that we really don't like Bermuda grass in our uh, Northern California landscapes is because it goes dormant during the winter time. Okay, so it dies back during the winter time. It goes into a dormant state, very low respiration. Um, uh, but then, uh, uh, so if that Bermuda grass is sort of scattered through a lawn, then the lawn areas look dead during the winter time. And I've got a lot to say about that. We'll talk about it when we get into turf grasses um, later in the semester. But um, uh, so with Bermuda grass, it's very challenging to control uh, just because it has very aggressive rhizomes and stolons. And even just a little itty bitty piece of a rhizome or stolon of Bermuda grass will grow additional plants, right? So if we if we um, mow that Bermuda grass and we chop up its rhizomes and stolons, then we're just spreading that grass more. So it's really important to be able to identify that weed before it goes to seed, because it doesn't just spread by rhizomes and stolons, it spreads by seed as well. And you want to get the get rid of Bermuda grass in our region. Um, there are some regions that use it in their lawn, and frankly, it's pretty appropriate. Um, uh, and again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about turf grasses. But um, uh, so with these, it's very important to be able to identify them by their leaf parts. Um, so that you can 
try your best to eradicate them before they go to seed and make matters even worse, okay? So in looking at this, um, identifying characteristics, blade, remember the blade is a portion of the leaf. It's just a portion of the leaf. So identifying characteristics, um, some uh, blades are flat with a, an acute tip or a pointed tip. Some are flat with a rounded tip and some are V-shaped, okay? Or considered folded and then they might be boat shaped at the tip where that rolls up and essentially make, looks like the end of a canoe, okay? So these are some very common um, uh, blade shapes that we can look at. Other interesting identifying characteristics on, on grass-like plants, if we're looking at their blade, can be some pubescence, okay? So some hairs and typically, those hairs are very sharp, okay? So examples of that, pompous grass is notorious for being very sharp. It's something that you can get a grass cut from. Miscanthus or maidenhair grass, same thing. It's a great identifying characteristic of it. It is very sharp, okay? It has, it has some pubescence on it that are very stiff and can cut you. Identifying characteristics of a sheath. So if we're looking at that sheath, remember that sheath portion is the lower portion of the, um, of the entire leaf itself. And that leaf sheath is again, the lower section of a grass leaf, which encloses its associated comb internode. Okay, so sometimes the sheath, if it does not, if the plant does not have a comb, sometimes that sheath is all the way down at the base. Okay, that's the only spot where we see that sheath. So sometimes it's just a very, very small portion of the leaf, whereas the blade in this case would be much larger. So characteristics of the sheath are split or open where it doesn't wrap entirely around the comb inner node. Okay, there's a split or an opening. There's also overlapping sheaths where one side of the sheath wraps in and tucks under the other. And then there's closed or united sheaths where in order to actually see the comb inner node, you would have to tear this apart, okay? The overlapping and the split or open, you could just unfold it and unwrap it from the comb inter internode, the closed or united sheath, you would actually have to tear right from this V down in order to see the comb internode. So on that backside or the outside of that leaf um, uh, is, is the collar, okay, is the collar. This collar is considered a broad collar. This is considered a narrow collar, okay? But the broad and the narrow collars go from one side of the leaf blade all the way to the other side of the leaf blade. There are also divided collars, okay, where it goes from one side of the leaf blade, but doesn't quite make it to the midrib, doesn't quite make it to the midrib of the leaf itself, okay? Other identifying characteristics, we already talked about the oracle, the oracle. And now the oracles are described as claw-like appendages at the base of the blade of some grasses. Some grasses do not have any oracle, okay? So this is an example where we have the collar and it's shown here that this is an open collar, okay? It could be a overlap or a closed or united collar as well. But each example here is showing an open collar. This one is an overlapping oracle where there's claw-like appendages that wrap over and overlap themselves. And then there are also short 
short um, append or um, oracles. Okay, so some, again, some of the oracles are short where they don't touch or overlap. Okay, but, and, you know, they're not all going to look like this. They're not all going to look like this. So they might have some sort of identifying characteristic about them. But these are the basics, either none, short, or overlapping. Now, the ligule, the ligule, which is a thin membrane or fringe of hairs at the junction of a leaf blade and sheath of grasses. Okay, so the ligule is this portion here, this portion here, this portion here. Okay, so in this case, the ligule is a fringe of hairs, is a fringe of hairs. This one is a membrane that's rounded at the top. This one is a membrane that is toothed at the top, okay? So these are, again, just different parts of the monocot or grass-like monocot leaf that are identifying characteristics that we can utilize to be able to identify these plants. And again, a lot of times we're identifying these plants um, uh, during a period when we can't utilize their flowers to be able to identify them. And so instead we're using their leaf parts to identify them. And let me zip back really quick and sort of reiterate, remember there's a lot of grasses and especially a lot of the ornamental grasses that are used in landscapes that are winter dormant. Okay? Now, when we're planting, a lot of times, well, in an ideal world, we're planting in fall. It's a great time to plant because um, temperatures are turning down, plants are respiring more slowly. Um, there's not as, as much evapotranspiration happening. Um, it's a better time for plants to be able to establish themselves through mid to late fall and then continue to establish themselves during the winter when there's not heavy drought stress. And then by the time spring comes around, they've established their root system and then they can grow on. Now, that's ideal. In the real world of horticulture um, in California, not all states, not all areas are like this. Not all areas of California are like this. We plant year round. Okay, Of course, there's areas of California that are caked in snow uh, throughout the um uh, throughout the winter time. And so, of course, uh, uh, horticulture professionals are not um, planting plants at that time, but the majority of California um, landscaping and planting happens year round. Um, so, um, uh, in the summertime, if you're planting some of these deciduous monocots, if you're planting some of these deciduous monocots, then you typically will be able to see their full leaves, their, uh, sometimes their flowers. And so it's easy to be able to identify, okay, well, this is the Mullenbergia, the Mullenbergias go here. This is the Calamagrostis, the Calamagrostises go here. If we happen to be planting these plants in the wintertime, a lot of times the nursery stock that we're getting is completely cut back because they're dormant. So they get the, in the nurseries, they cut them back entirely, um, of course, without damaging the apical meristem, but they cut them back entirely in the winter time. And so a lot of times, if we're getting these plants to plant in the winter time, we may not see anything that in, we, we're, we're not gonna see any flowers. Um, and we're only gonna see a little portion of the leaf right? Because the blades have been primarily cut back. Remember though, on those um, plants that do not have a comb, those monocot plants that don't have a comb, their leaf sheath is down at the base. So when you're receiving plants like that, you're looking at the characteristics of the sheath. You're looking at the characteristics of the collar. You're looking at the characteristics of the oracle or the absence of the oracle. And you're really looking at the ligule as well, okay? So um, case in point, 
Um, Rastas, well, I think we talked about this one last. Come on, really? Just try. Okay. There we go. Callum Grass's Carl Forrester. Images. Remember this plant? Oops. This plant right here. Okay, so if you're receiving this plant in the wintertime, you're going to see nothing. Okay, you're going to see a plant that's completely cut down. Um, and I think I mentioned last week or in a previous lecture that um, this plant is narrow and tall. <clears throat> so typically this plant does not grow wider than about 30 inches unless you let it keep going and going. You never divide it and then it'll get a little bit bigger, but typically less than 30 inches or less. Another plant is uh, Panicum brigatum. Jump into these. So Panicum brigatum is a switch grass, actually kind of an interesting grass. Switch grasses um, uh, <clears throat> are one of the plants that they're looking at for biofuels. They've been working with Panicum for quite a while. It's a very vigorous grower. There's some of them that are invasive, but the really cool thing about Panicums is that they're large grasses. They're quite tall. Um, but they get, most of them get really phenomenal fall color, like crazy fall color when they're dropping into dormancy. Now, when they're completely cut back and you're receiving them in the wintertime, they look incredibly similar to a Calamagrostis. But the ligules are very different. Now, the importance of being able to identify these, and this is a specific case, the importance in being able to identify the difference between the two if you're receiving them in the wintertime is that if you plant 150 Calamagrosses Carl Foresters when they were supposed to be Panicum Vergatums, um, you won't realize it until they've already established themselves and they're coming into full growth at some point in the spring. That's when you'll start to really be able to recognize it. So checking those, um, and then the spacing will all, all, all also be off because if they're calamagrosses, remember they grow to about 30 inches wide, whereas panicums, the majority of them grow to about four feet wide. So if you planted calamagrosses thinking that they are panicums, then there's gonna be a lot of additional space between each plant or vice versa. If you received panicums, but you thought that they are calamagrosses, and you plant them at 30 inches on center, they're gonna be significantly overcrowded when they grow in. So from that standpoint, it's very important to be able to identify this stuff. And you might think, well, if I ordered Callum this, why would Panicum show up? Well, not every nursery person that pulls all of the plants from the nursery gets it right every single time, right? Sometimes even Amazon sends you the wrong thing and sometimes target sends you the wrong thing, right? So you got to understand that, yeah, sure, it can happen. So you, as the horticultural professional, want to make sure that you receive the correct plants. And I guess there's probably some also some questions out there that are, aren't they always labeled? Generally, yes, they're labeled. But I'd say maybe 10 to 25% of the time you're receiving nursery stock that is not labeled or there's one plant that's labeled out of the 150 that you ordered, okay? So lig uh, the ligule, another important piece to be able to look at to be able to identify those plants. So let's look at some real life pictures. Again, looking at this, we have leaf sheath. And in this case, this is an overlapping leaf sheath. Okay, so here's our leaf sheath, and you can see that there's a portion of that leaf sheath that wraps on the outside while the other side of the leaf sheath wraps and tucks under that other side of the leaf sheath and um, covers up that comb internode. Okay, so here is the leaf collar. Okay, and if I zip over here, here you see a leaf collar, and this would be considered a broad leaf collar. I'm sorry. 
a narrow leaf collar, a narrow leaf collar, okay? But it's definitely not divided. The next piece of this is there is a leaf blade, okay? A leaf blade, and sometimes that leaf blade is called the lamina, the lamina. We'll just call it the leaf blade though, but know that it's it, it's sometimes considered or called the lamina. Um, on the blade itself is a mid rib, okay? a mid rib, sometimes very, very defined, sometimes incredibly faintly defined. Okay, so that's also another important identifying characteristic. Um, and then you have the parallel venation. Okay, so here again, blade or lamina. Here, we haven't talked about this in the real life pictures here. Here you see the ligule, okay? So this one right here would be considered a membrane ligule that I can't tell, it's so, sort of tooth at the top, maybe not rounded. Here, ligule, okay, you can see that ligule. Sheath, blade, and then here would be the collar. Okay. And then the only one that's showing this in here, I guess, uh, oh, these aren't quite oracles. This one shows oracles though. Okay. Now I would say that like, I, I might consider this overlapping, right? They are crossing each other. So this is probably considered an overlapping oracle. Okay, so those are the identifying characteristics of monocot, grass-like monocot plants. Okay, grass-like monocot plants. Okay, not not quite as much to this one as the um, the dicots, but um, uh, 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 there are these specific. Um, identifying parts of the monocot leaf that we use. Now, the reason that this is quite a bit shorter than our dicot, um, our dicot uh, uh, lecture is because remember with the dicots, there were a lot of different types of leaves, right? There's simple leaves, compound leaves, pinnately compounds, bipinnately compounds, palmately compound, et cetera. There's different arrangements, right? Opposite world, um, uh, uh, alternate. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's um, specific margins, specific shapes, right? So quite a bit more to it, but um, uh, with the grass-like monocot plants, these are the elements that we're looking at to be able to identify these plants. Okay. And that's it.